So good evening and welcome to the second event of our ninth season for the speaker series. Now let's turn to our speaker for tonight's event. Here are a few things you should know about Dr. Khanna. He was born in India and grew up in the United Arab Emirates, New York, and Germany. He is an accomplished adventurer who has traveled to 150 countries on all continents. He holds a PhD in international relations from the London School of Economics and both bachelor's and master's uh, from the School of Foreign Affairs at Georgetown University. As if that wasn't enough, wait, there's more. He has been an advisor to the U.S. National Intelligence Council and served as a special advisor to the United States Special Operations Forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. But wait, there's more. He speaks six languages. English, German, Hindi, French, Spanish, and basic Arabic. And pretty soon we're going to learn which language he's going to use tonight. <laughs> his TED Talks have been viewed more than three million times. Among his many honors, he was named one of Esquire's 75 most influential people of the 21st century. There's more. But it's time to bring up our speaker. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Parag Khanna, author of several books, including his most recent one, Move. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mark, for that generous uh, introduction. It, it, it took a lot of, um, it took more hours of emails back and forth, mostly my fault, entirely my fault, to get this date in the calendar uh, than it took to drive here from uh, Chicago. So it's a reminder of how convenient it is to reach this blessed geography of, uh, of, of Michigan. And I haven't spent enough time in this state, uh, but I'm, so I'm delighted to be here and to visit uh, with all of you. Um, and uh, I've been looking forward to this because the, the, the very beginning of this book, Move, uh, I answer this question. I set out this question, where will you live in 2050? And we actually kind of came to the conclusion that it's Michigan. So here I am. It's the first time I've actually been in the state since, actually, since, <laughs> since writing those words. I wanted to validate my research. Uh, I'm an empirical, data-driven you know, person. But the story, the backstory, which is a great place to start, is that, um, and I'll start with this slide that helps to kind of map out the reasoning. Uh, a good friend of mine, Greg, who's also one of my, my business partners, uh, we started, we were writing an article for Reuters uh, for, their, for the journal um, more than 10 years ago, and, uh, or 10-ish years ago, and Hurricane Sandy had just happened in, uh, in New York, and he was living in Brooklyn, and he found the response, the local government response to that hurricane to be absolutely abysmal. And a lot of people's homes were kind of, you know, flooded and they lost power and there just wasn't enough kind of rehabilitation support. And even as a, you know, wealthy guy, he just said, you know what, I'm fed up with this. You know, Brooklyn isn't, isn't worth living in this fabulous bohemian place, Brooklyn, that everyone talks about and thinks is so cool, is not worth it when you have a hurricane come along. I'm out of here. And uh, he moved to, uh, to Canada, uh, to Montreal. Now, that's kind of like an extreme step, if you will. But we started writing this essay, and we said, well, you know, let's think a couple of decades ahead, right? Where will people live in light of climate change? But that's not the only factor, right? Russia comes out OK in climate models. Does anyone want to move to Russia? <laughs> like, probably not right now, right? So we created these kind of filters, like, OK, so which places pass the climate test? Which places pass the political test? Which places have viable economies? Which places are culturally capable uh, of absorbing you know, uh, uh, larger populations? And we kind of said, well, let's, let's put the world, every place in the world, through these tests and see who comes out on top. A place where you can safely say, 2050, I could live there. Kids might live there. Good place to invest. And we centered around the Great Lakes region, right, for a whole host of reasons. And there are not many other places in the world that, that make it through those tests, right? Now, this is obviously gravely ironic at some level, because as you know right now, even though you live in a great spot, and, uh, and I know that you appreciate that every day, uh, the demographics still point to people moving away uh, from here, which, you know, strikes me as bizarre, but it's just that 
all of this complexity that I'm talking about, the thinking about the politics and the climate and economics all at the same time, and then projecting into the future and picking out those spots, that's not the way people typically think. You re we respond to one thing, like you lost your job in the financial crisis, right? A factory closed and the, worker, the work went away to China or whatever the case may be, right? And people respond to those short-term things. They don't necessarily have the luxury of long-term sort of strategic mapping and taking in all these scenarios and so forth into account and saying, well, that's where I'm going to be no matter what, so I'm going to stay and tough it out. Right? That's not, and and that, we can understand that. We can sympathize with that. Um, and that's what I'm getting at here. This, the title of this slide is, You Don't Get to Pick Your Crisis. Right? We live in a world where, simultaneously, we've got demographic imbalances uh, afflicting our economies, right? so labor shortages, the gap between young and old, the stress in the social security system, all of those things that happen when, when you have a low fertility rate, not enough young people, and uh, aging population. You've got the political upheavals. That's international as well as domestic, right? It's people saying, I don't want to live in a fill-in-the-blank, red state or blue state, right? Or I you know, want to wear masks or I don't want to wear masks, right? Or um, Russia invades Ukraine. Suddenly, five million people uh, you know, have to vacate uh, the country or more, right? Again, both domestic and international. You don't get to decide necessarily what the politics of your location are going to be. Then you've got economic dislocation. So I mentioned the financial crisis, outsourcing, automation uh, of labor, factories being closed. That pushes people, drives people away. Middle class, ordinary middle class folks across the, across the what we now call the, the Rust Belt. Uh, but also, you could be a, you know, a millionaire hedge fund trader on Wall Street, but an algorithm has come along and taken your job. You could be a lawyer at a fancy law firm. And there's algorithms now that do all of the case analysis for you. Right? So technology, economic cycles, and crises also dictate where we can and cannot afford potentially to live. And then there's climate change. Right? And climate change has shaped where we live for hundreds of thousands of years, obviously. But over the last, say, 12,000 years since the retreat of the last ice age, we've more or less settled into stable latitudes, right? And so we've taken for granted that climate doesn't change, but now climate, of course, does change faster than it has in a long time. And that has, again, become a factor. Now, it isn't just one of these things. I put little plus signs here. This is like a very simple arithmetic equation, right? You take all of these forces that push people around for one reason or the other, you multiply it by connectivity, which is our infrastructure, right? particularly transportation, energy, communications that enable people to move, which is more dense than we've ever had, obviously, ever. Right? We spend $4 trillion a year globally on infrastructure. Here in the States, we don't, we don't uh, sort of um, punch, our, punch our weight the way we're supposed to or used to on infrastructure, and that's obviously why it's a big political issue. And you get accelerated mobility, right? All of these factors push people to move. The capability, the capacity to move is growing. And therefore, we will move more than ever. So very simple math here. But ironically, I finished the book right before um, January 2020, right? So COVID broke out, and you know, everyone was supposedly, we were locked down for the last uh, couple of years. So, so even my publisher was like, this is kind of Ironic, right? This is a, you sure you want to stick to that argument? And I was like, hell yeah. You know, I want to double down on this argument because I want anyone in this room to tell me with a straight face that this COVID, as tragic as it was, as significant as it was, the most, really the most documented event in human history by, by far, right? Um, but tell me that it's a bigger deal in the grand scheme of history than climate change or technology right, or globalization, or geopolitics, or global demographic shifts. Tell me that that one pandemic that locked us down, pinned us down, some of us, not all of us, for a couple of years, is the most important thing that's ever going to happen ever. That, that the map of humanity is frozen in time forever because of one COVID lockdown. It's not right. This is, this is a bigger deal. Right, a much, 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 much bigger deal. So I'm here to double down on this argument. People are going to move, not just millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. In fact, I went back 
This is actually pretty, again, pretty simple. Look at the, the number of people who crossed borders and relocated from the 16th century, the 17th century, the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century, right? Start out, you can start with the slave trade in the 15th and 16th centuries, right? Millions of people were chatteled around the world. You've got colonialism. The British Empire moved uh, Indians to the Caribbean, to Africa. You've got Chinese people who moved south into Southeast Asia. You've got, again, you know, flows of, that's still numbered in the, in the millions. Then you start to get into uh, the larger migration waves as Europeans particularly came to America, right, in the 18th and 19th century. You start to get into the tens of millions, right. In the 20th century, actually hundreds of millions of people, uh, if you add up World War II, right, the Holocaust, genocide, the partition of India and Pakistan, right, wars and chaos everywhere, right, and also labor shortages. We began to import tons more Latin Americans and Asians in the middle of the 20th century in that period of labor shortages. Europe did the same with Turks and Arabs from their former colonies. In all, hundreds of millions of people moved in the 20th century. So you see what's been happening, right? The decimal place keeps moving to the right. So I predict in this century, where we're kind of in the early uh, decades, probably easily a billion people will cross borders, will move, will relocate. The decimal place will keep on moving, it's been moving, and there's many reasons why it will move, and COVID's not gonna stop that, right? We're already well underway. Already now in 2022, the largest number of people that have ever lived outside of their home country is right now, ever in history, right? 300 million people. So there you got 300 million right there, right? Then, the number of people who are Climate refugees now is the, e equals the number of political refugees and equals the number of political migrants. And these things all add up, right? So many, many reasons why, and we're only in 2022. I got 78 years still to be correct. And, and so, and I'm, I'm well on my way. So if you want to place a bet, you know, sure. I'm, I'm going to win though. Uh, so let's talk a bit about about geography. Fundamentally, this is actually a book about geography. Uh, it, migration is a lens that I use to talk about geography. Again, the livable and the unlivable geographies. But fundamentally, I wanted to tell an integrated, sort of a synthesis story about the dynamism of geography and that struggle to find the kind of optimal places. And so I use, the, I use the word geography in the plural here, geographies. I think that geography is treated far too simplistically. You know, when, when I say geography, you think, ah, earth science, right? We've got this map over here, natural geography, right? Not much debate here. Blue is water, the oceans. Brown is sand, the deserts. Green, the forests. White, the snow. We take it for granted. We view it as a static kind of representation of the world. What's so interesting about geography? It's pretty banal. But now we know, again, with climate change, it's very, very dynamic, right? And that affects political geography, right? This is the, uh, the second layer or type of geography. This is the one we're most familiar with. This is the map you've got in all your offices and the classrooms all over the world. It's this. And we take this for granted. But this, too, also is changing all the time. 1945, United Nations was founded. There were 51 members. Does anyone know how many members there are today? 200. There's nothing um, immutable, sacred at all about this map. Just look at Russia and Ukraine, right? Just look at Yugoslavia. You've got wars all the time. States are born, states die, right? So nothing sacred and you blend in the climate angle. There are places that are becoming unlivable. People just won't be able to even live there. It won't even be a country anymore, right? And that's only two layers. The third layer of geography is functional geography. This is the connectivity I was talking about on the first slide. This is the world that we have built. Not the map that we inherited from World War II. Not the map of nature, the earth as we've inherited it. This is the world that we build. We build these highways, railways, internet cables, oil and gas pipelines, electricity grids. We spend $4 trillion a year, the whole world together. That's more than all the defense budgets in the world, by the way. Take all the defense budgets in the whole world, put them together, multiply it by two, 
that's what we spend on building things, not just on destructive tools, right? So we build this map all the time, right? Every time there's an interstate expansion um, or we get a hydroelectric power line from Canada, that's, that goes on this map. And that's generally positive stuff. This is the, and this changes the way governments, societies deal with each other. And it changes where people live because people want to live near high quality infrastructure. People want to live in cities. The world population has been urbanizing for centuries. It used to be that 30% of the world population lived in cities. But as of just 10 years ago, 60% of the world population lives in cities. I, I can well imagine that you know, 50, 20, 30 years from now, almost everyone will live in a city of some size or the other. It could be South Haven size, or it could be Chongqing, China size. But pretty much everyone clusters into cities. It's almost human nature to want to be among other people. And that's also here. And you can see it here. This is the fourth layer. This is the fourth layer of geography. This is human geography. This is the geography of us, the distribution of people around the world. And as you can see, we're 8 billion people. Every human is a pixel on this map. This actually has 8 billion pixels here. Um, so we've got a lot of people. Africa's got a lot of people. Europe's got a lot of people. Asia has by far the most people. About half the population of the planet is just Asians in Asia. And um, so now take a good look. So now let's look at the, the purpose of this book was to answer the question, where are people going to live in 2050, right? And you can take it. You can't necessarily predict where the next war is going to break out, even next month, let alone 20 years from now. Can't predict what the technologies are going to be that are going to shape economies and uh, that are going to drive innovation. Can't be so sure. A lot of things we can't be sure about. But one thing that, is getting, that we're getting better at modeling is climate change. Right? We've got we have very, very precise modeling of the ecosystems and resource dis distribution, what's happening with temperatures and sea levels and uh, uh, soil fertility and all of these things. We've got satellites, you know, uh, you know, thousands of them circling the earth, mapping all of this, and also then modeling what, climate, what could happen under different climate scenarios. We can't be exactly certain which scenario is going to happen. It depends on how intense emissions are and all these other things, but we can make some good guesses, right? So now look closely at this map. Now watch what happens if you layer in, if you animate, I'm gonna do an animation right now. You're gonna animate in what happens when temperatures rise two degrees or three degrees Celsius over the next 10, 20 years. This is called the suitability index. So the same people who have been doing the climate modeling that informs the uh, IPCC reports, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, part of the United Nations, They've been looking at what's called the suitability change. A red zone means that it's decreasingly suitable for human life. It's just too hot, right? It doesn't get as, the, 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 the territories don't get enough time to cool off at night. So the days continuously stay hot and the nights get warmer. So your body has a hard time adapting. It doesn't mean you literally cannot live there. But there are definitely places that you will not be able to live or want to live. And green means places that, relative to their previous conditions, are becoming more livable. So here, your summers may be getting longer. There's, you know, Russia has become the world's largest wheat producer and exporter. You know, 25 years ago, we didn't think, ah, yes, get my wheat from Russia, right? Um, that's how there, there's companies that are trying to figure out how to plant soybeans in Russia. Not the first thing we would have thought about you know, the geography of soybean cultivation you know, uh, uh, 10, even 10, 15 years ago. But notice the, the mismatch, the, the paradox between the previous map and this map. Most of the world's people right now today live in places that are turning increasingly red. And the countries whose populations are flat or even declining are green. And that, to me, is the biggest paradox in the whole world. I, don't, I can't think of a more ironic or perverse, strange situation at like a civilizational scale, like humanity. Not like, you know, what suits my interest or your interest or what do we think about what's right and wrong here and now. Think about if you think about the world in a utilitarian way, in a fraternal way, all of us, what's best for all of us? Survival. 
8 billion people, what might we want to have? Well, survival, right? We've, we're all in this together, right? Well, if you want 8 billion people to survive, it's not looking so good if everyone is frozen exactly where they are, right? We can probably agree on that. We may not want them all coming to Michigan, but we can agree that, well, if everyone's life is equal, and there's 8 billion lives here, and this is where we're headed, you know, may seem a bit, like I said, paradoxical. It is. And guess what? There's no roadmap to get out of this, right? No UN study, no Washington plan. Washington can't, you know, pass <laughs> legislation, uh, you know, before, before Memorial Day. Uh, so it, there, there is, we've never been in this boat, right? Like we meaning everyone, like the, the capital W, we. Never been in this situation. No one's got a plan for this. And so the answer isn't really going to come from some global technocratic body, some you know, interagency committee. We're going to be winging it. We're just winging it. Right? That's what's happening right now. So in the course of noticing that that's what we're doing, I sort of set out to say, well, what would ideally, what could happen, what would happen, what should happen if we believe these climate models and if we, again, think about these filters, right? Well, what places can and should people go on the basis of political stability and climate suitability and all these other things? Let's map it out. Let's put it on the map and think about how we get to a better sort of human geography. That was the purpose of the book. So right now we're in a situation where even the most strategic, vital, economically significant, rich cities in the world are themselves fighting against climate change, right? On this map, you've got LA, New York, London, Dubai, Singapore, Hong Kong, Beijing, Tokyo, the most significant commercial financial centers of the whole world are also coastal cities um, at, or, or, or at high risk of either drought, rising sea levels, or other kinds of climate maladies. So we can't take anything for granted, right? No country is a perfectly secure fortress as it were. Um, and so we have to think about how do we adapt to the situation, not just uh, each city, each country, each society, community, wherever you may be. But right now we're focused a lot on mitigation. This is what you hear about in the news every day, right? What country has signed the Paris Agreement? You know, to what, what percentage are they bringing down their greenhouse gas emissions? What are companies doing, right, to decarbonize, to green their supply chains. All of that falls in the category of mitigation, reducing emissions, right, trying to bring the speed of climate change under control. But that doesn't exactly reverse or stop climate change. And let's face it, we are still at, um, at, at, at a, we've reached kind of a, maybe the maximum level of total annual emissions that go into the atmosphere every year but it's still a huge amount. Even if it levels off, that highest volume ever is being added into the atmosphere every single year, and it accumulates there. And therefore, even if you were to green everything tomorrow, and we all lived off of renewable energy, which is, again, not what's happening, you'd still have climate change continue and probably accelerate. You know, the climate, one has to understand, is a complex system. It doesn't snap back. Right? Just even if you stopped greenhouse gas emissions, it doesn't mean that uh, places that have had perennial drought, where it hasn't rained in decades, suddenly they're going to have torrential rains. It's not what's going to happen. Right? And therefore, you always have to think about what is going to come next. It's not going to look like 1990 or 1900 or 1800. It's going to evolve in new directions. And it, the climate, is not going to adapt to us. We have to adapt to it. So we put a lot of attention diplomatically and financially into the, into the mitigation agenda, which we should. That's great. It's important. Uh, but that's about 95% of all the spending that's, going, that's devoted to climate issues, whereas only 5% is going into adaptation, right? And adaptation is the tangible things that we need to do right now to combat coastal erosion or adapt to it, right? to reduce what's called urban heat island effects. So we, you know, we build up cities, and we live in these dense cities, and we all use air conditioning. We actually make it hotter outside than it would otherwise be if we hadn't built in that way. 
So we've artificially made our own kind of suffering even worse. And maybe even new kinds of infrastructure, modular homes, uh, mobile homes, movable infrastructures, resettling populations, just moving people. The simplest, best, safest, cheapest adaptation to climate change or to anything, even Russia bombing your country, the safest, the, the fastest thing you can do and the guaranteed way to survive is to move, like pick up and move. And in a way, the, one of the punchlines of this book is to move is human. That's what we've always done. We've been nomadic. For, 300, for the better part of 300,000 years, humans were nomadic. Right? Only in the last 7,000 years did, in some parts of the world, we settle into stable agricultural and then urban, you know, agricultural, pastoral, and urban communities. For the better part of human history, we've been nomadic, and we are certainly capable of moving, even if we like and even if we enjoy life perfectly well exactly where we are. I do, you do. But we're capable of moving if we need to move. And we don't think enough about this because we've generally gotten quite, at least in advanced Western industrial societies where the climate has been stable and we're wealthy, prosperous, we've gotten used to kind of being stuck in place. But that doesn't mean that we can't resettle populations. We can. And in many ways, we actually need to to overcome these demographic imbalances. We've got these labor shortages, right? Or to rescue people from war-torn areas or from climate-stressed areas. So even if you don't want to move, there are definitely people who do need to move. You know, hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions, of people who need to move. And they can physically move. Think about all that connectivity we've got. What's it there for? This is uh, actually a sequel, this book, to a previous book that I wrote that was only about infrastructure the whole network of global infrastructure. And I kind of wanted to answer the question, OK, we've built all this infrastructure. What are we going to do with it? We're going to use it to move stuff, right? Not just people, but goods. All global supply chains, all trade and industry depend on connectivity, being able to actually physically move things, right? Right now, part of the reason we have inflation is because you've got bottlenecks, right? Disruptions to that connectivity, that seamless connectivity that we take for granted. So how are we going to use it? So. I started looking at these maps, the climate models, and then for political forecasting and scenarios and saying, well, if you could take the 8 billion people of the world and reorganize them with a wave of the pen and draw a new map to ensure maximal human survival and a good quality of life for everyone, especially young people who are the future, right? where would you put them? So I started with the climate map, and I said, OK, well, you've got countries like Canada that are really you know, welcoming to, to immigrants. They've got uh, you know, 400,000 new migrants every year. So the last couple of years, uh, I think off and on, there have been as many or more immigrants going to Canada as to the United States, and they've only got one-tenth our population. Right? So it's a pretty big, it's 1% of Canada's population is in, increasing every single year by that much. So you see I've circled the Great Lakes region, much of Europe. Now notice something really important. Let's test the laser pointer. Yeah. So when we think about climate change, you know, people talk about it globally. And of course, it's a global issue. It's the truly one truly global issue. But of course, it doesn't play out equally everywhere. Right? And this is why it's important to remember that even though we, America, and Canada, and Europe, and Japan are the rich, modern countries of the world, we're not in the same geography. Right? In fact, if you look at it this way, in terms of latitude, we are kind of the front lines. The latitude of Rome is pretty much the same as New York, right? about 41, 42 degrees north latitude. And you can see right around here what the models are telling us about parts of the United States. You can see that only parts of Spain are in that situation. So even though, we're, even though we and our peers and allies are in a similar situation in terms of our wealth and our prosperity on a per capita sort of basis, we in America are really the front lines on climate change because we happen to be further south than them. So don't look to others to kind of be the canary in the coal mine and the other countries that we cover in our news, our friendly allied countries, to be the signals. Don't wait for them to get hurt before we start paying attention. We're the ones getting hurt first because of our latitude. Our latitude is just different, right, further south. That has advantages, that has disadvantages. Well, for thousands of years, and certainly hundreds of years, it's had great advantages. We have a lot more agriculture than they do, right? Um, 
and our populations are, are, has, have become much larger. Right? The United States has a much larger population than any other uh, Western society. But it also has disadvantages when you think about climate change. So we're the front lines. We've got to figure out our strategy. But I call these the kind of climate oases. Right? These are the places that could, could, not will, not must, not even necessarily should, but could be the places that could absorb more people. Climate change says they can. Politics, not necessarily. Economics, not necessarily. Culture, not necessarily. But maybe. So you start by looking at the green zones. Start by looking at places that already have good infrastructure. Um, looking, at, looking for stable governments. Uh, looking for uh, progressive immigration policy. Looking, look for diversifying economic activity. And that's where I put some of these stars. So in the book, I kind of take you through some of these places and say, well, are they capable of absorbing more population? Will they? And so on and so forth. And the answer is I'm not really sure, but some of these climate oases will become the new centers of human civilization. New York wasn't always the center of the universe. London wasn't always the center of the universe. It's always changing and shifting and evolving and morphing, right? Depending on politics, depending on climate and other things. So I asked myself, well, if people are going to move, where are they going to move? And the, the places that they're going to move are logically going to become new anchors of the world economy and so on. And I hazard some guesses as to what they are. And there's some obvious ones, and there's some not so obvious ones. The further north you go in England, the more climate resilient you get. So a place like Scotland that wants to secede in any way from, in any, from the United Kingdom is a perfect climate oasis. Very far north, tons of fresh water, lots of agriculture, stable government, welcoming in talented migrants, has uh, innovative economy, great universities, and so on. Canada, definitely a winner, no question. Great Lakes region, definitely a winner, right? Um, uh, bits of Eastern Europe, certainly Scandinavia, uh, Eastern Russia, Japan, and on and on and on. We can talk about any one of them if you like. As I said before, our, our situation is different. This is, uh, I'm going to quickly just mention, this is something called a climate impact study. It, it forecasts what happens to the GDP of every county in America by the year 2040. So this is like a leapfrog 18 years into the future. If you have a worst case climate scenario in terms of temperature rise and the impact that has on heat stress, GDP, and all these other things, uh, yellow and orange are not where you're going to want to be in 2040, according to this fairly authoritative study. Places that are darker colored, hooray, uh, you know, are, uh, are going to experience the highest natural GDP gains as their populations grow, as their geography can support greater uh, populations and economic activity. This is not a linear path. Nothing in climate modeling, nothing in life is linear. Everything is complex. That was the purpose of my very first slide. It's always complex. There's a very circuitous pathway to whatever fate you know, uh, sort of awaits us. But it could be this. This is a scenario. It can be this. They're pretty much predicting it will be this. But we'll see. But certainly the conditions. The geographical conditions are looking pretty good for this neck of the woods. But what's interesting is that over the last 100 years, the population of America has been moving away from the north and the east towards the west and the south. Meanwhile, it's like, OK, west and south, hmm, right? But as I said before, we don't, we don't make our day-to-day -day individual decisions in the year 2007 or 2008, or 2020, 2022, on the basis of this integrated complex picture of the future that we don't even know whether or not to believe in. One thing will push us somewhere. So whatever it has been over the last, literally this map, this, this chart goes back to 1920 to 2020. Population of the South has grown, West has grown, Midwest down, Northeast down. Now, I imagine that that's going to, in a logical world, if these scenarios play out, you would imagine that that's going to reverse, right? Uh, and it would save us a lot of money, right? And it would be good for the economy here if it did reverse, if we took a rational approach. These are just some headlines from major publications, New York Times and other studies, saying, you know, climate change is making parts of the US uninhabitable, but people are still moving there. And yet, up to 70% 70 70 of our net worth is tied up in one home, right? Our primary residence. Um, that's, that's setting the stage for a pretty nasty wake-up call if you're living in the wrong place. So whatever map you're looking at, whether it's uh, 
a tax map of you know where where the lowest property taxes or no income taxes. That's why people are going to Florida, or a climate map. Ideally, pick a bunch of maps and layer them together, and see which one tells you the best combined story and think about where you're going to go. But again, that's not how we sort of make our policies at a federal level, right? Our fiscal policy is done in the reverse of the, what I'm advocating. So when Congress is going to allocate billions of dollars to something, it's everyone feeding at the trough. It's pork barrel, you know, kind of divide and rule sort of politics. But when you're thinking long term, you kind of want to take things in reverse. You want to look at climate models. You want to look at the industrial potential, economic potential of geographies, then you want to nudge people to move to those places, to work in those industries, and to be in places where there's less climate stress, so you don't have to pay tons of money for flood insurance, fire insurance, and all those other things, and spend your life rebuilding things that are getting destroyed. And then you want to think about your infrastructure spending, right? Where should we, if we're thinking 50, in a 50-year cycle, around electricity grids and highways and railways and airports and uh, uh, gas pipelines. Maybe we got to think about building them and putting a little bit more money in the places where people actually will live or should live based upon this picture about climate and industry and so on. We don't exactly do that here, right? Um, we do things bottom up. We do things haphazard. Uh, we do things in, um, in you know, very politicized ways rather than in this through the strategic lens. But this climate niche, right, the latitudes of optimal habitation are changing. We're going to move with them the way people have always moved for hundreds of thousands of years. But we, we are mobile, but our real estate isn't, right? We have to think about how we build accordingly our infrastructure, our housing, and all of the other facets of modern civilization uh, to um, accompany this. So I, I'm an advocate of us thinking about strategically, with foresight, long term. You know, how do we do this climate, migration, infrastructure, nexus? Text is too small, don't worry about it. I'm basically saying what I said before, which is think it through, whether you're thinking about um, uh, the geography of uh, agriculture and farmland, you're thinking about the roads and the, and the food storage facilities and cold storage, thinking about, of course, the highways and the freight rail, uh, thinking about the energy generation, renewable and non-renewable, whether it's power plants or, again, gas pipelines, mm -hmm. military bases and infrastructure, right? You know, you know our defense budget's pretty large, right? <laughs> you know how much of it is, well, I, I actually don't even know the exact number right now off the top of my head, but it's a lot, that goes just into fortifying our bases or moving bases, kind of bailing out bases that are flooded, fighting fires that are near bases and so forth, right? That's like a lot of money right there. None of that money is being used to confront China, right? It's just being used to bail out a physical infrastructure of our military here in the country. So again, some foresight is needed in every single part of our, um, uh, of our economy. Now, people are waking up to this, right? So people are mobile, but real estate isn't. But the American dream is to own a home. And so younger people in particular, according to all these surveys, are saying, I'm going to be pretty careful where I'm going to buy a home if I'm going to buy a home at all. It better be in a climate resilient place because 75% of Americans you know, are, say that it would be a bad idea to buy in a climate risk area. 80% of Americans have experienced a heat wave. 40% live in counties that have experienced some climate disaster or the other uh, color coded here by type of you know, extreme meteorological event. So like I said, amongst rich countries, we're the front lines. It's a very large percentage of our population that has been affected by uh, climate events. It costs us a lot of money. It eats into um, our home values. It eats into our retirement savings. And we need to, we can't just be reactive anymore. We have to be more uh, proactive. Uh, what I do in my kind of like professional life is to run a company that tries to model this. I'm right? trying to say, where is land affordable today in climate resilient areas where you ought to be uh, developing residential or other, all the infrastructures that we need for our modern life and making it affordable for Americans and Americans present and future to reside so that we can 
build those new future civilizational centers and thrive and prosper despite the climate change that we have lost control of. I think it's a fairly again, rational thing to be doing. And indeed, you can look at counties all over the country. There are 3,000 plus counties in America. You can look at lots of different counties and you can see exactly what those conditions are from the climate standpoint, from the property market standpoint, tax policy, and build these models that give you a sense out to the future. We got to 2040 and we show how this appreciation um, is likely to unfold if you have a rational adaptation uh, to, to climate change and so forth. And so that brings me, uh, and, and what I, as I mentioned before, you want to be thinking about where you build your infrastructure, right, on the basis of uh, the geographies of opportunity. Um, let me just jump ahead. I mentioned also that, uh, you know, Canada, we're becoming more and more integrated with Canada, and this is not just an issue just for one country. We share a continent with them. This is the lo longest border in the entire world. It's actually the most heavily trafficked border in the entire world as well. We're doing a lot more trade because of the China tariffs of, uh, from the Trump administration onward. The US now trades more with Canada and with Mexico each than we do with China. There's a temporary blip against that right now just because of uh, some supply chain dependencies and import dependencies of ours. But I think of this as a continental challenge, right? It's our continent in a race to remain livable and survivable versus other continents, right, economically. And we are still the best positioned continent, right, by far. We have, what, what does it take in geopolitics in a big picture sense to be the winner? Well, the winner isn't the one that conquers the others. The winner is the one that's the most sufficient, self-sufficient, that doesn't need the others, right? Victory is not needing, victory is independence, right? That's what geopolitics is ultimately about. And so that means, therefore, which location in the world has the people, has the food, has the water, has the industry, has the technology, has the knowledge, has the political stability. Well, guess what? When, again, you put every continent in the world through those tests, the winner is not South America. The winner is not Africa, right? The winner is not Asia, and the winner is not even Europe. You can see what happens when Russia turns off the gas, right? Right here, here you go, right? So let's not screw this up. If we don't screw it up, actually, it's sort of like do no harm, right? Uh, if, if nothing else, if we just do no harm, we should be okay. Uh, we can get this right, but we shouldn't think of it as a purely American issue. It's actually a North American continental issue. That's what geopolitics ultimately is about. We have this peaceful continent. Now, final couple of words. Um, what does it mean for here? And, you know, well, actually, sorry, going back to this map. So when I first started thinking about this Great Lakes region, it was actually about seven or eight years. Well, there was the, the, the article that I mentioned that I did with my friend uh, 10 years ago. And then I did a book on infrastructure that I mentioned, the prequel to this book called Connectography. And I started making ma these maps. This map is actually from that book. And I started saying, you know, if we think at a continental scale about the winning regions, as I said, you know, we settled upon the largest uh, in repository of fresh water in the world, which is, of course, the Great Lakes, as the kind of winning region on these models, but also from the standpoint of the functional geography and the political geography, right? So we know that climate, climate change will be good for us here. We know that geopolitically, we're stable in this region. And we know that functionally, we're integrating in terms of trade in a productive, progressive way with our neighbors. Even Trump signed the USMCA trade agreement, right, which is like NAFTA plus. He said he never wanted to sign it, he signed it. We're much better off him having signed it, especially not knowing that COVID was gonna happen and that we would depend more and more on our neighbors rather than on these far-flung supply chains that are breaking down. So when in doubt, turn to your neighbors, right? Our neighbors are a lot better than Ukraine's neighbors, right? Or uh, China's neighbors for that matter, right? So take advantage of what you've got. And, but one of the things that I wrote in that book is that if you think about Michigan here, which obviously straddles this, uh, this border, uh, and you take a city like Detroit, said, what is the future of that city? Said, actually, you know, logically, it's the midway point of this thriving Chicago-Toronto corridor, right? And Toronto is Canada's kind of New York and Chicago 
you know, sort of put together, right? Most of the economy of Canada, at least the industrial economy, is right here in Ontario. So we need to think about the future of, you know, say, Detroit in that example, but Michigan in general, as part of this broader continental uh, ecosystem and draw strengths from both sides and think, of course, about the bigger picture that I was painting earlier about how we're going to have to adapt infrastructurally uh, to, to climate change, politically to climate change. And this is the picture that you get. And it's one in which, of course, the Great Lakes region are right in the middle and Michigan is right in the middle of that. So it's, I didn't, obviously I don't need to sell the story to you because here, here I am finally in the promised land. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to you know, come about this from a purely logical perspective, right? as scientifically, as rigorously, as economically uh, mindedly as possible. And this is a, a part of that logical arc that has drawn me to, uh, to consider this the place to be. But we're not going to, again, you have to prepare for it, right? You don't want to be one of those places that gets overrun. That's not the problem you have right now, other than in the summer, I hear, right? Um, <laughs> but even in general, right, it, you want to prepare and adapt. You want your housing policy, you want to have adequate infrastructure, sewage, um, you know, wastewater treatment, um, uh, affordable housing, right? All of those things you want to pre-plan, and that's part of how it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, in a way. By doing the things that make you a desirable place to be, you become that place and you stay that place. And it doesn't happen automatically even if climate change says it will, right? It requires a lot of foresight, a lot of investment, a lot of strategy, a lot of commitment, but that's the task, that's the job, that's the work, in a way, that's the economy that yourselves can, are already hopefully engaged in some way. Certainly your children, your grandchildren will be too. I hope so. And if they do, that'll be the Michigan that you're going to want it to be. I'm, I might be mix, mixing some of the maps up, but two places that surprised me were um, there was a country east of Bangladesh. I couldn't quite tell what that was. Yeah. And then in the United States, Appalachia didn't look like it was so bad. Mm -hmm. And other than climate, I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> I can tell you that it's got a lot of trouble. So right. just curious. Yeah, it's a great question. So the country uh, east of Bangladesh, good catch, that's Myanmar. And if you look at upper, so politically, not a desirable destination, right? Um, but climatologically, it's a very upland area, very rich in water. The Mekong River cuts through northeastern uh, Myanmar rich in forests, farmland, uh, and so forth. So right now, it doesn't have a huge population, but it certainly could. And the people who are retreating from the rising Indian Ocean, uh, Andaman Sea, and other waters there, especially Bangladeshis, will probably wind up uh, in that territory of Upper Peninsula or Southeast Asia. So I circled it as one of these oasis zones. Very turbulent politically, but has potential, let's say. In terms of Appalachia, it is interesting because climate analysis of the Appalachian region 10 years ago was actually more, say, positive about it than more recently. And so I'm not sure exactly what to believe, and we'll see how it plays out, right? 10 years ago, people were saying, oh, you're going to have a lot more vineyards in the Appalachian region, and it's going to really develop uh, economically. Populations will move there, and they'll seek, you know, slightly higher elevations and cooler air and all these things, but there's also fire risk, right, as well. And the infrastructure isn't yet prepared to cope with that. So again, we can, we can change the future, right? We can, it, it can become uh, an area that's sort of thriving, certainly more than it, than it has in, in the last decades, but it'll take, it'll take a fair bit of work. What happens if the temperature goes up four degrees instead of two. Well, it's it's a great question. A lot of people are asking that right now, and and uh, you know we're pretty much most people think locked into a two degree change, and people also speak with great confidence about exactly what that means, right? You know exactly which places become unlivable and which rivers dry up and which sort of. Uh, which, which bio, which, which sort of uh, cycles in that, that regulate the planet uh, sort of go off kilter and so on. But beyond two degrees, honestly, people don't really know what happens. You know, the, the impact of something beyond two degrees could be, uh, 
could be bad enough, right? It could, again, kick off these chain reactions that are already uncontrollable. And it won't really matter if we get to 3 degrees or 4 degrees. So I, I don't like the way, on, on the one hand, I think it's important to build these models and run these scenarios, if nothing else, than to scare ourselves into doing the right thing. On the other hand, we're lying to ourselves if we think we know what exactly is going to happen. Because already things are happening in terms of uh, permafrost melting and peat bogs releasing methane and the nitrogen cycle breaking down and oceanic acidification uh, intensifying and the coral reefs dying and on and on and on and on that we didn't think would happen at one point whatever degrees rise we're at now. So, you know, you uh, honestly can't take what one, one, one can't even, perhaps even begin to fathom what might change. Um, so four degrees is way beyond what I think uh, we would ever want to know. Let's put it that way. Uh, it's, it's potentially that bad. Here is the mic. My understanding is that the carry capacity of the planet is a lot closer to 2 billion people than the 8 that we're pushing. And if we've got all that migration happening toward these climate oases and we are at the overpopulation that we're already at, can you speak a little bit about the, yeah. the limited resources yeah. and the competition for them? So we're at 8 billion heading towards 9 billion, probably peaking at below 10 billion. So most of the people that will ever live in the world are actually alive today. Um, the curve is already flattening because fertility is really down. Young people aren't really having children, uh, certainly not the way uh, present generations have. And so we, in terms of optimal carrying capacity, that, that has multiple meanings. So one is just food production, right, and, uh, and, and resource consumption. There actually is enough food for 10 billion people. It's the distribution uh, of the food, right? right? During COVID, we've had two years of food waste, even more, even greater than has existed before because all the, the border closures and so forth, right? So I saw some news reports of the, you know, thou literally millions of tons of potatoes, right, rotting in Montana and Idaho and elsewhere. Uh, same thing happened all over the world. Um, so there's enough food technically that's being produced to feed people, to give them a, 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 you know, appropriate caloric intake. But it's the geography of that that's, that's uh, messed up. Now, 8 billion people actually is not that many people compared to what we thought the world population was going to be 20, 25 years ago. We thought that it could reach 14, 15 billion people. That would have been like a lot. But, <laughs> but you know, 8, 9 billion people is not actually, you know, because it's not much more than we have right now, we can pretty well imagine where it is. One of the things I point out in the book is if you take the land area, the land area of all the continents, it's 150 million square kilometers exactly. And 8 billion people can all fit standing side by side, um, you know, in, I don't know, the, 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 the greater vicinity, in this county, right? Literally, you could fit 8 billion people standing like this in, in this Van Buren County, you told me, right? Yeah. So that, the problem is distribution, not the number, right? And in terms of our technological capacity to grow food all over the place, to get it to places if we knew exactly where to get it and how and without friction and inefficiency and bottlenecks, uh, and to um, have fresh water and to desalinate water and do rainwater collection and, and harvesting, we can, we can do that physically. But in terms of the per capita emissions output of a wealthy world, that's bad. So, but that doesn't mean that you have to reduce the number of people in order to reduce emissions, right? We have technological solutions to that as well, right? Um, so, I don't, and it's obviously, since we can't just lop six billion people off the world population, it's almost unrealistic. But uh, my very good friend, Chris Tucker, who's the chairman of the American Geographical Society, where I'm also a trustee, he wrote a book called Planet of Three Billion. And what he argues in that book is that if you look at the pre-climate change sort of world, the time period, the mid 20th century, end of World War II roughly, the world population was just three billion people. 
And if we were to go back to 3 billion people, well, then we would definitely be able to manage. It's obviously fewer lives to save, right? Less uh, kind of concern, if you will, and, and certainly uh, a lighter emissions intensity than 8 or 9 billion people. Makes total sense. His argument from getting to, from A to B, from 9 billion you know, to 3 billion, is simply, is actually doing the right things. It's largely female empowerment, right? And kind of engineering a glide path towards a stable population and not making it a uh, stigma, you know, to have only one child or no children or whatever the case may be. And then we'll kind of just naturally get there. But we're not gonna get there anytime soon because we're still growing, not declining. And therefore, you still have to reckon with the fact that all of these climate effects are baked in for 9 billion people over the next you know, 10, 15 years, and it's gonna be 9 billion people, and not, not 2 billion people. So yes, we've exceeded our carrying capacity in many ways, but presuming that the population stays what it is, which, which it will, uh, we've gotta think about practical technological uh, solutions. Do you uh, foresee any conceivable um, mega catastrophic situations such as uh, perhaps the melting of the uh, polar ice caps and uh, tectonic plate shifting as consequence, things of that nature that are well beyond uh, um, common conception today. Right. It could be that, it could be you know, solar flares, it could be a whole bunch of things that you know. People have speculated about for sure. Um, and they don't come into our day-to-day -day consideration because they're, you know, like sort of lower probability. Um, but things like, uh, you know, a sudden accelerated melting of the polar ice caps might be the most plausible of the catastrophic scenarios that are out there. And therefore, there is a lot of thinking about that. And that could happen prior to the four degree Celsius thing, right? It could happen because simply, again, when you no longer have winters as cool, then you're gonna have melt even in winter time, or slower, obviously, but and more rapid melt in the summer and these kinds of, what, what just happened in the last couple of months was a report that you, you've never had like simultaneous heat waves in the Arctic and Antarctic. What they didn't really mean a heat wave, they meant the Antarctic in winter didn't, was the highest temperature it's ever been in winter, which is still like colder than Michigan in winter, but definitely not as cold as it's supposed to be. Whereas in the Arctic, you actually have like rel on a relative basis compared to what they're used to, like heat waves. Like in Norway, you're having like, you know, heat waves and stuff. You've had record Arctic ice melt and this kind of thing. So it's like forest fires in Greenland. I didn't know Greenland had forests. So they've got, they were having forest fires, so obviously they have forests. Um, so these kinds of things. So if you had that record ice melt, over multiple seasons and it was un irreversible, right? If it's gonna happen one, two, three, four years in a row, it's also gonna happen five, six, seven, eight years in a row, right? You're also gonna probably gonna have to reckon with all of those other things too, which is why you also can't be so totally sure about what the civilizational centers of the future are gonna be because today's forested areas don't exactly have, um, you know, fire departments uh, everywhere, right? The, the forest fires in Siberia, in Russia last summer were larger than all the other fires on the entire planet combined, right? I'm not gonna move to that place, yeah. right? Russian, Russian, the Russian fire departments are nowhere to be seen, apparently. Um, so all of those things could, could well happen at the same time. But I mean, so I, I'm a, a, sort of aware of those scenarios, and that's gonna mean, obviously, that coastal populations need to retreat a lot faster, and a whole lot of other things, obviously. It's gonna have an impact on, obviously, on uh, the, um, the oceanic currents. And the oceanic currents are gonna have an impact, obviously, on uh, the maritime economy, right? And, and so on, and so on, and so on. And, and, and obviously, on our meteor meteorological patterns, our weather, everything gets affected if something like that happens, not just one thing. You know, I was very interested in what you said about desalination because of so many p places not having enough fresh water and they wanting our Great Lakes water, which, which they're not going to get, um, hopefully. <laughs> because of this compact, we'll talk about that. Anyway, I'm wondering about the pace of desalination because that would help tremendously 
uh, both for the rising uh, sea levels and for places that need fresh water. And I, I wonder if you have any new information about that for us, because right. we all see that as, as key. Great, great question. So by the way, on the Great Lakes Compact, um, you know, uh, when I talked about sort of, you know, the American desire to revisit the terms with Canada in Canada, ooh, bad move. <laughs> bad move. You don't want to go on CBC radio and talk about what might happen if, you know, America pushes to revise. They were like, no way, <laughs> you can't have it. Um, so um, in terms of desal, this is a critical adaptation measure, right? It's on that right side of the equation, things that we absolutely urgently need to do. And these things, infrastructure takes time. Never, never happens ahead of schedule, does it, right? Only in China, and then it's like the wrong stuff. Uh, here it's behind schedule, even if it's the right stuff. So desal is happening fastest in California, and God knows they need it. But um, it's incredibly energy intensive, right, obviously. So it, you know, right now it's mostly gas powered. Uh, but you can do um, large scale nuclear power desalination. Uh, there's even concentrated solar power setups for desal. But this, the shore fire bet, like, if you, I don't like to talk in these sort of silver bullets, but if you, but, but experts might say nuclear power desalination is like the one trick pony to kind of make sure that wherever we are, no matter where we need to be, where we're driven to be, if, if water is the essential element for survival for all human beings, which of course it is, then you want to make sure that everyone anywhere, anytime has f water to drink and to grow food. And again, we can grow food even in a parched area just through hydro and aquaponic technologies, which you can literally do underground because they use LED light. Um, you just need the power and the desal. So, so nuclear desal, in two words, is our fail-safe option. Um, and there's a bit of work on that, billions of dollars going into it, but not, not enough, probably. It should be like tens of billions, probably, here and everywhere. Well, so now, again, it's like, you know, we're behind. We're behind, um, way behind on that. Based upon uh, your map of the southern hemisphere and the equator being the uh, last border, uh, I don't think Berkshire Hathaway is going to make much of an investment in the southern hemisphere. Is there no, no oasis in the southern hemisphere? It's a great question. Um, there are, actually, when you look at those same maps, there's... Um, uh, river basins and forested areas in equatorial Africa, countries like Gabon, um, parts of, uh, of Congo, um, parts of Botswana. There's areas that are actually, you know, again, becoming more livable over time, but that's just climate models talking. It's not the demographics or the, or the geopolitics or any of those other things, right? So. Most Africans are going to stay in Africa. Most South Americans are going to stay in South America, right? By, by dint of geography and geology, it's very difficult for them to just sort of, you know, pick up and move. As you can tell from what's happening on our southern border and in the Mediterranean Sea, they're not exactly welcome, right? And, and by, 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 based upon their socioeconomic standards of living and other things, they're, they're kind of stuck. So I think Africa has to build a better Africa Right, rather than, pres I mean, sure, tens of thousands will try and, and, and succeed to make it to Europe, right? Sometimes they cross the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia and make their way elsewhere. They make their way across the Atlantic, too, and they wind up, you know, Eritreans. I talk about Eritreans in the book. As a percentage of their own population, no country has a larger diaspora than Eritrea. No Eritrean wants to live in Eritrea. It's a small country, but still, every young person, job number one is get out. And they, they wind up literally like, you know, in, in Cabo, like, you know, trying to make their way across the, the Mexican border. So, um, um, but 99% right, of South Americans are going to be born, live, and die in South America, the same for Africa. So for, for them, it's about not just finding those oases, but building those oases, or preserving the existing geographies they live in, and expanding their agriculture, right? I mean, a lot of African agriculture is, is exported, 
but actually they need to grow more food for themselves so that they don't have to worry about having it processed elsewhere and then re-importing it and things like that. Build their whole industry around environmental sustainability and make that their economy. Because they're not going to be building Mercedes, right? I mean, the way global economic shifts and supply chains have happened is that, is that industry has followed the low wage but increasingly productive areas. That's why jobs were lost here and wound up in Thailand and you know, China and elsewhere. Wages were cheap, but they built technological industrial clusters. And now that's happening in Southeast Asia, even Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines, and even India and Bangladesh and Pakistan. And so a lot of people used to think, and just as recently as the last five years, that, oh, well, I guess Africa comes next because labor will be cheap. And, uh, and, and, the, and we can industrialize it. But that's not what's actually going to happen because we've got robots now. We've got robots here, robots in Europe, robots in Japan, robots in Korea. Robots will take the jobs before Africans will get the jobs. So both for South America and for Africa, they need to maximize their existing resources sustainably and adapt to climate risk. Obviously, stop destroying the Amazon rainforest and do lots and lots of other things right to make their continents the best place for them to stay, because they're mostly going to stay. On your map, there was um, an area in gray that kind of centered on northern Illinois, Chicago area, and over here. Was that the shale underground? And what is the implication of that, that there's shale there? I think the gray shading on the North America map is shale deposits, right? And so, but what happens to them varies by state, by regulation, by federal law, by investment sort of demand in those places. So Western Pennsylvania and Texas have moved ahead in that and faster than other parts of the country. So I'm not sure what will be, whether or not we'll utilize those resources or not. The Biden administration, has just loosened restrictions on investment in gas producing um, uh, investments, uh, which is really the opposite of what he said he was going to do during his campaign. But obviously, given what's happening with Russia and so forth, uh, that was a quick move that they made. And it hasn't been as much, it's been noticed, but not necessarily criticized. Again, my politics, your politics doesn't really matter. We're just seeing what's, what's happening. But uh, overall, in terms of gas as like a transition fuel, a bridge fuel, you know, and uh, as something that, that, you know, we need, you know, if the, if the view is uh, solar can't do it all and you need to service your base load of power demand uh, with a steady supply of energy and, you know, uh, and gas is the way to do it, ideally there's a way to, with, with lower carbon intensity, uh, extract and harness uh, that gas. So that's probably what will eventually happen here as it's happening in other parts of the country. But we have no, again, no reason to have energy shortages, right? I mean, North America has as much raw energy potential as Russia and way more than Saudi Arabia, right? And way more than Brazil or Venezuela. So it's just how we do it. And again, I think it would be embarrassing and sad if we, did, you know, is the most advanced technological economy in the history of, the, of, of humanity if we can't square that circle, right? So I think, again, project to work on. Thank you. Thank you.